Afternoon, everyone. Good to see you all. Welcome to our worship this Sunday. Just a few announcements as we begin. Uh, well, really just one announcement, and that's just to say the midweek is on this Wednesday in the church hall. Uh, so that's at 8 o'clock um, for Bible study and prayer. Uh, so you're very much encouraged to, to come along to that Wednesday at 8. Aside from that, I just need to do my, my usual photograph of you. Start with this side. Oh, wouldn't want to miss you out there, Isabel. Okay, and there, and oh, do that. Work better. Right. So as usual, it'll be on my phone, and if it's not needed, which hopefully it won't be, it'll be deleted then in a couple of weeks. It always seems slightly strange to have to do that at the start of a service, but we now get started properly, and we're going to do that by reading from Psalm 105. I suppose our theme today is sent on a mission. We're going to see later on how Jesus sent the apostles out with a mission, with a job to do, and our opening verses here in the Psalm reflect this. It says, give thanks to the Lord, call on his name. Make known among the nations what he has done. Sing to him, sing praise to him, tell of all his wonderful acts. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Amen. We're going to, to sing together, and whilst we've remained seated for singing up to now, I think it's probably safe enough to stand as long as we continue to sing. We've been more softly than normal, so we're going to stand to sing, Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. Summer 
there was one or other announcement I should have made, uh, and that's to say next weekend um, is our scheduled harvest weekend. Now, in the circumstances, um, the elders met together and we decided we would just have the one service, so Sunday morning or Sunday at 12 noon, because we can't have supper. If we did two or three services, we would have, would have needed a deep clean between each service. Um, so in light of the current circumstances and the fact that we'll only be our fourth week back, we've taken the decision just to have one service for this year. So that will be 12 noon for our harvest um, Thanksgiving next week. I was reminded by that as we sang, um, and the second verse speaks of harvest. So that's next Sunday where we will give thanks. But we come now to prayer. Let's pray together. Loving and gracious Father, we praise you for your faithfulness, your faithfulness to who you are, your faithfulness to your promises, and your faithfulness to your people. We praise you that there is no shadow of turning with you, that you don't change, and nor do your compassions ever fail. For all these reasons and so many more, we worship and we bow before you. We confess though that the pressures and demands of daily life can often cause us to take our eyes off you or get distracted from following you. So we thank you for this Lord's Day, this day where we can rest from our work and rest in Christ's finished work for us, that finished work at Calvary which allows us to approach you with sins forgiven and acceptance assured. Help us to draw near to you in this time, Refresh our souls, we pray. Build us up in faith and encourage our spirits. Pour out upon us a prayerful attitude of heart and mind. Give us joy and freedom in your presence as we celebrate your great love for us. Teach us by your word. Speak through it to comfort the troubled and to trouble the comfortable. Be especially near all those who are unable to come today. Those who would love to be with us, but who feel unable to uh, at the present time. Bless them uh, as they join us at a distance, whether that be online or through listening on in on CD. Come and minister to us now through your spirit in this time of worship. Grant us love for our families. Forgiveness towards our enemies, peace towards our neighbours, and openness towards our fellow believers. For we pray in the loving and mighty name of Jesus. Amen. We turn now to our first reading from God's Word. We have a couple of readings today, both from Mark's Gospel. Uh, we began a series last week in Mark's Gospel, so we pick up. Uh, in Mark 6 where we left off and we're going to read Mark 6 verses 6 to 13. Let us hear the word of God. Uh, and he, that's Jesus, was amazed at their lack of faith. Then Jesus went around teaching from village to village. Calling the twelve to him he sent them out two by two and gave them authority over evil spirits. These were his instructions. Take nothing for the journey except a staff. No bread, no bag, no money in your belts. Wear sandals, but not an extra tunic. Whenever you enter a house, stay there until you leave that town. And if any place will not welcome you or listen to you, shake the dust off your feet when you leave as a testimony against them. They went out and preached that people should repent they drove out many demons and anointed many sick people with oil and healed them. Amen. We thank the Lord for this reading of his word. <clears throat> if you managed to make it on holiday anywhere this year, maybe your plans were changed from your original and they weren't quite what you'd thought they would be or you maybe didn't end up where you thought you would be. 
But anytime we go on holiday, we have to pack, usually have to pack a suitcase or a rucksack or something like that. And just going to think briefly about the kind of things we would pack if we're going away. I would maybe pack, oh, I brought a suitcase with me. So you might pack clothes, or you will pack clothes, <laughs> um, depending where you're going. If you're going somewhere nice uh, or sunny, you'll maybe pack shorts and a t-shirt, um, maybe sandals or flip-flops, that kind of thing. You'll need usually swimming stuff. Um, you'll need basic stuff like toothpaste, toothbrush, shampoo, that kind of thing. Um, if you want to build sandcastles, you need a bucket and spade. You might take a book with you, or a Bible. You might take a, a tablet, if you're thinking, well, the weather mightn't be so good. I'll bring a tablet, so I uh, have uh, something uh, to do if it rains. If the weather's going to be good, you'll need suntan lotion, a hat. Um, if the weather's going to be nice, you might need these. Some sunglasses. So there's all kinds of things we need to pack if we're going to be going on holiday. Um, now there was a time we read about when Jesus had sent his disciples away somewhere. Now what did he tell them to take with them? What were they to take? If they had a suitcase, what would they put in it? Well let's see. Nothing. Nothing. The only thing they were to take was a staff which was really a walking stick. They didn't have nice smooth um, footpaths in those days. So the ground was rocky, so they would have taken a staff to help them walk, to help them stay stable. A staff was really a walking stick. So that's what they had, they had nothing with them. So they didn't have any clothes, they had no food, they had no money. And also, he told them something else. He said, don't take an extra tunic. So that was like a, a jumper or a coat or something. So quite often if people were going on a, a journey somewhere, they might have had to have slept out in the open air. Now, of course, Israel is generally warmer than here. But even so, it gets a bit cooler at night time. So you might pack an extra tunic if you're going to be sleeping outside. But Jesus said, well, don't take an extra tunic. Don't take any of these things. Now, why was that? Why did Jesus say, take nothing? What was it? What was the reason for this? Well, there were two main reasons. The one reason was he wanted them to realize they weren't going on a holiday. They weren't going to need a bucket and a spade. They weren't going to need their swimming suits. Um, or whatever the equivalent would have been 2,000 years ago. They wouldn't need any of those things. They weren't going on a holiday, but they were going because they had a job to do. Jesus was sending them out on a mission. Jesus was sending them out, sending them out to proclaim the good news about him, to share the message about him. So he was sending them out with a job to do. But there was another reason as well. God, want, God was going to provide for them. So he said, don't take any food, because God was going to uh, take, when, when they went to town, God was going to lead them to stay somewhere where people would have fed them, somewhere where they could have stayed. So they didn't need to take any food with them. They didn't need money to go and buy food, because God was going to provide that. God wanted them to learn to trust in him. And so God sent them out with a job to do and to help them learn to trust him. You know, God has given us a job to do as well. God wants us to share the good news of Jesus. And he wants us to trust him as well, to know that when we do that, when we serve him, he will help us and he will, uh, he's given us a spirit um, to, to give us the help we need when we serve him. So we're going to pray together. And just as, um, I guess, the disciples had good news to share then, we've still got good news to share today. So let's pray. Dear Father, we thank you that the story of Jesus is good news. Good news of a Saviour who died for our sins so we could know you as our God. Lord, help us to tell others the good news of Jesus. We thank you that you sent your Holy Spirit to help us. So we pray you'd help us to trust you and to, uh, to share your good news. 
we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So, as I've said, we're having two readings today. We've had our first one. The second one's actually back, a few chapters back to Mark 3. Uh, and this will help, I suppose, give a bit of context to what we see happening today. Because we see in today's reading uh, that Jesus called the twelve to him. So we're going to go back to Mark 3 where he called the twelve apostles. And also where he, he said what their job was going to be. So it's back in Mark 3. Uh, verses 13 to 19. We read this. It said, Jesus went up on a mountainside and called to him those he wanted, and they came to him. He, d he appointed twelve, designating them apostles, that they might be with him, and that he might uh, send them out to preach and have authority to drive out demons. These are the twelve he appointed. Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. To them he gave the name Boagenes, which means sons of thunder. Andrew, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. Amen. Before we turn to our study of God's word. We're going to pray. We're going to, uh, I suppose, dedicate the offering at this stage and also ask God to guide us as we turn to uh, his word. So let's pray together. O Lord our God, we, we praise you that you are the giver of all good gifts, that you're the God who loves a, a cheerful giver. And so we ask you to receive and bless these offerings which we present to you. That whether they're in the offering plate on the way in or the way out, whether they've been given um, by, by check or by direct debit, we ask that you would bless them. Uh, and with them ourselves, our souls and bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable through Christ our Lord. Uh, and Father, just as we have read your word as we turn to study it now, we ask that you would teach us through it. It's not head knowledge we're asking for, Lord. But humbly, we're asking you to work in our hearts, that we would gain a fresh glimpse of, of Jesus. A fresh revelation of who Jesus Christ is. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you are here today. That you're here with us by your Spirit. Come and speak to us now, to each of us, in a powerful way. That your name would be lifted high in this place. And that you would be glorified in our hearts and in our lives. Amen. Amen. If the title Mission Impossible brings anything to your mind, it's maybe the, the TV program from the, the 60s and 70s, or, or maybe the films from more recent years starring Tom Cruise. And whatever comes to mind, if either of those things come to mind, you'll know that the program or the film always involves a specific goal that Dan Briggs or Ethan Hunt, the main character, was supposed to accomplish. They had a mission that they were given a mission that they had to follow. Companies will spend significant amounts honing uh, their mission statements. You might even see fast food restaurants will have up on their walls um, their mission statement just to assure us that they're committed to providing the best fish and chips or the best burgers, um, whatever it happens to be. And our mission it's the primary thing we set out to accomplish. And at its most basic, the word mission implies two things. Firstly, being sent. And secondly, being given a task. Being sent and being given a task. The first point, being sent, makes sense because the word mission comes from a Latin word, which means to send. 
And then the second point, I suppose, is implied in the first. You're sent to do something. You're sent to accomplish something. Not to accomplish everything, but to do a particular task. And that's what we see in our passage today. We see the, the, the apostles being given a specific mission. They're sent out by Jesus. Sent out with something to do. And we're going to look at that today. And we're going to look at it under two headings. We're sent out with a mission. <clears throat> not everyone will like it. We're sent out with a mission. Not everyone will like it. So the apostles were given this mission. And by extension we have as well. So first of all we're sent out with a message. <clears throat> so last week we saw Jesus in Nazareth. This week... He moves on. He moves from village to village teaching. But that's not all we, not all we see in today's passage. Because along with Jesus' teaching, he also uh, gives his disciples, the apostles, a job to do. He sends them out. And it's something that they knew would have been coming. It's something they would have been expecting. We read Mark 3, or a part of Mark 3, and there we see how he appointed 12 and designated them apostles. That they might be with him. That he might send them out to preach. Now often we think of the words apostle and disciple as interchangeable. We think of them as the same thing. And in some ways in this case they are. Because we, we call the twelve apostles here. We call them disciples. And they were disciples. But what we see at this stage in the, in the story. Is really a, a change in some ways. They move on from being disciples to acting as apostles. What do I mean by that? Well, the word disciple means uh, follower or learner. Up to this point, they've been following Jesus. They've been learning from Jesus. They've been seeing how he uh, did his mission and how they, they were to follow him. Now, they haven't, of course, stopped following Jesus. But now they're doing the second bit of it. They're serving as apostles. They're being sent out, which is what apostle means. It means one sent out by Jesus. So the disciples are now sent out to serve Jesus. They're sent out with a message. But also we see they're sent out with authority. Authority from Jesus, given by Jesus, over evil spirits. Now, there isn't much focus on the message here. We're just told they're sent out two by two. So we aren't told at this point, or in this verse at least, what their message was, what it is they were going to say. But we are told they were given this authority over evil spirits. So does that imply to us that somehow the message was secondary? That the message they proclaimed was a secondary thing? And that the miraculous was primary? Well, what has happened in the chapters up to now? What's Jesus said or what's Jesus done? What have they seen Jesus doing? Well, of course they'd seen him heal the sick. They'd seen him cast out demons. But what was his primary purpose? Well, Jesus tells him himself, chapter 1, verse 38, that he came to preach. Chapter 2, 17, he came to call sinners. A few chapters on from this, 10, 45, he came to give his life as a ransom for many. Or Luke's Gospel 19 verse 10. That he came to seek and save the lost. So Jesus came to give his life as a ransom. He came to die on the cross. We know that. But what was his purpose on the way to the cross? What was his primary purpose? Well it was the proclamation of the good news. It was, a, it was the announcement of the kingdom, the call to repent and believe. That was Jesus' primary purpose. So why then does he give the apostles here this authority over evil spirits, this authority to heal and exercise demons? Well, yes, it was out of his compassion for those in pain. But more significantly... It was to testify to his authority and to point to his identity. 
So when Jesus performed these miracles, it was to show people who he was, to point to his identity. And so when he gives the apostles this authority here, it's to authenticate the message they bring, to prove that they're telling the truth about Jesus. It's a message, a message with authority, but also a message here with, with urgency. We have thought about the specific instructions he gave in verses 1 to 10. You know, no bag, no bread, no money, and so on. Nothing except a walking stick. That, that's all they were allowed. They were to travel light. But why was this? Well, I'm going to fill out a wee bit about the two main reasons. First of all, it was to remind them that there were people on a mission. They weren't on a holiday. They weren't there to enjoy themselves. Especially, there were people on a purpose. They weren't there to be distracted. There were people with a message to proclaim. They were coming with good news to share. Good news, but also a warning to bring. They were coming with the same message that John the, Bra John the Baptist had brought in chapter 1. The time has come. The kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. There were men with an urgent message. And the very fact that they were traveling light would have told the people who they came to, the people who heard the message, that they weren't there for a long time. But that now is the time to respond to Jesus. That now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. Now, now is always the time to respond to Jesus. Not next week, not next year, not next whenever. The same truth that the apostles' instructions implied here is the same truth you and me need to grasp today. That now is the time to come to Jesus. Now is the time to put your trust in him. Maybe you've put Jesus off. Maybe you've put off coming to him. Maybe you've put off coming back to him. Now is the time to come. That's what their traveling light said. That's what it showed. The fact that the message was urgent was one reason for the instructions. But the other reason was to teach the disciples to trust in the Father. We've seen over past months how quickly the things we may be trusted in and, and life can be snatched away from us. You know, people have lost money. People have lost their jobs. People have, um, you know, become sick, lost their lives. You know, now is not the time to trust in in things, but the trust in God. The people, the apostles were sent to learn that, to learn that they needed to trust in the Father. And we need to do the same. We need to trust in God. The apostles and us are sent with a message. Jesus gave them instructions, but he also prepared them for the response. He prepared them by warning them, not everyone is going to like it. Not everyone will like the response here. Verse 11. If you, and if any place will not welcome you or listen to you, shake the dust off your feet when you leave as a testimony against them. At times, as Christians, we, we can maybe look at those who don't believe and, and, but, and yet who have heard the message of Jesus. We can think, how can they not believe? How can they not put their faith in Jesus? When they've heard the good news. Or how can they turn away from Jesus. From following him. When they know it to be good news. As Christians we know the gospel to be good news. We know that Jesus is a wonderful saviour. And we look at those who reject him. Or reject his message. And we think. Well, how can they not see the truth? How can they not see their need of a saviour? We can think that. Can't we? We can think that when we see those around us rejecting Christ. And yet, it's always been so. It's always been like that. And Jesus prepares and warns his disciples that people will reject them. They will reject their message. You know, this passage we're looking at today comes in the midst of a larger section about rejection. Last week we saw Jesus being rejected by the people of Nazareth, the people in his home village. And then next week, all being well, our the week after harvest, we'll see how um, John the Baptist gets rejected. 
his message about Jesus gets rejected to the point that he ends up being beheaded for proclaiming Christ and his word. There always have been those who will reject Jesus, reject his message, reject his people. And so it's in preparation for this rejection that Jesus tells his apostles to shake the dust off their feet. But why this action? Why? I can't reach my leg up that high anymore. Why was there significance in doing this? Well, it was a practice that went back to ancient times. When the Jews had travelled to non-Jewish Gentile areas or Gentile towns, they were required to shake the dust off their feet at the border, lest this just carry any contamination from the pagan world into Israel. We're used to now washing our hands more, using hand sanitizer and so on to prevent contamination. Well, it was to prevent contamination that the Jews shook the dust off their feet in their day. Well, uh, as they saw, saw it as contamination. It's actually something we see Paul and Barnabas doing in Acts 13. They're on um, a missionary journey and they go to Pisidian Antioch. And there the Jews uh, stir up uh, persecution against them and ultimately expel them from their area. And as they leave, Paul and Barnabas shake the dust off their feet. The same kind of response that Jesus speaks of here. Why was it? Well, the Jews did it to show what they thought of of non-Jews. But here, and in Pisidian Antioch where Paul, Paul and Barnabas do it, it shows what God thinks of Jews who will not put their trust in Jesus, who will not believe the good news about Jesus. It's a warning to them, a warning to them that unless they come to faith in Christ, that they're no longer a part of the people of God. It's warning to anyone that our response to Jesus matters. Our response to Jesus matters. Matthew's account of this passage here we're looking at confirms this for us. Because we read Jesus telling them to shake the dust off their feet. And then in Matthew's account he goes on to say the following. In reference to towns that won't accept them or their message. He says this. I tell you the truth. It will be more bearable for Sodom and Gomorrah on that day, on the day of judgment, than for that town. More bearable for Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment than for that town that rejects Jesus and the message of Jesus. It's a sobering warning. A sobering reminder that how we respond to Jesus matters. That how you respond to Jesus will determine how and where you spend eternity. It's a reminder that, it's, that there's no such thing as indifference to Jesus. No such thing as sitting on the fence with Jesus. That you and I have to come to him. We have to repent and believe the good news and follow him as Lord. Jesus sent the apostles out with that message. But also he prepared them for the fact that people would reject it. That not everyone would like the good news that they were bringing. Jesus sends the apostles out and us on a mission. Now, for most of us, this won't be news today. We, we know that Jesus has called us to share the good news. And we know that there have been and there will be those who reject it. We know this. But perhaps rejection, either experience of it or expectation of it, has put us off sharing the message, the good news of Christ. Many of us are in that position that we know we should be playing our part in the mission of, of Christ. We want to play our part, and yet somehow we've just stopped speaking of Jesus. Maybe that's where you are today. You're here, or you're watching online, or listening, and you want to share Jesus. You want to be obedient to the task that Christ has given us. You want to play your part in the mission he's given us to do. And yet, you're unsure how faith can overcome your fear. You aren't sure how the hope of, uh, or the future joy of obedience can overcome the fear of rejection. Well, the Puritan writer Richard Sibbs, he said the following. He said that a Christian singing God's praises to the world is like a bird singing. 
Let birds sing loudest when the sun rises and warms them. So it is with Christians. When they are warmed by the light of the world, by the love of God and Christ, that's when they sing loudest. When we're warmed by the light of the world, by the love of God and Christ, that's when we as Christians sing loudest. The apostles here had been warmed, warmed rather than warned, warmed by the light of the world. They'd been warmed by the, the love of God in Christ. They'd been, been warmed by time with Jesus, quality time with Jesus, time spent with him, learning from him, delighting themselves in him, enjoying him, time of preparation that had warmed their hearts, that they were going out to share Jesus. Maybe we need to pray for the Spirit to warm our hearts afresh to Jesus. Maybe we've gone cold towards him in some way. May the Spirit warm our hearts, that we would spend time sitting under Jesus and his word, that we would spend time and learn from him, that we would grow in delight in him, that we would enjoy him in a deeper way. We would delight in him and enjoy him so that faith would overcome fear and so that we would naturally and joyfully share him and point others to him. Let's pray. <clears throat> Loving Father, we thank you for the good news of Jesus. We thank you that it is good news for all who will repent, for all who will turn and accept Christ, that there is the promise of eternal life, that there is the promise that you will accept us and welcome us as your children. Lord God, we pray that you would uh, st stir our hearts afresh by your Spirit, stir our hearts afresh to the good news, to Christ, that you would help us to grow in joy in him, in delight in him, that we would treasure him and enjoy him all the more, and that we would go out because of that, joyfully and gladly sharing him with others. Lord, forgive us for times when we have uh, taken our eyes off the message you've given us, when we have neglected the message. Lord, we ask that you would help us to play our part in the mission you've given us as a church, Lord, that you would help us to go out from this place joyfully sharing you. Lord, we ask that you would remind us of your love for us, that would stir us by your Spirit. Lord, we also pray for our world at this time. Lord, we see so much bad news on our TV screens or hear it on our radios. <clears throat> We know that there are so many who face uh, threats uh, due to, uh, to, to their employment. So many who have been made redundant or who face redundancy. So many people whose jobs are uncertain. We pray, Lord, that you would, um, I guess, bring uh, hope at this time to those in that position. And just that you would help us all to trust you with what we're going through. We pray for businesses that are struggling and pray you would give them your help. We pray for people in management roles facing difficult decisions um, where they've been given the task of laying workers off, which is always a difficult task. Lord, we pray that you would come and um, renew uh, our world, that you would come and work in each of our hearts and lives at this time. And we pray that you would use your church to be a light and beacon of hope in these difficult days. That you would assure us of your care and goodness at these, at these hard times. We pray also for those who are lonely, afraid or anxious. We pray for, uh, that you would bring comfort to those in that position. We pray for those who... Uh, those who would love to come out and join us but, are, but aren't able to and ask that you would assure them of your presence where they are. Lord, we pray you bless each of us. We pray, Lord, that you would 
Uh, I suppose grant us the assurance that you're with us in all that we're going through. And that you would grant us the assurance that you are the same unchanging God that we can still trust. The same God who's on the throne and who will be forever. And we come to you in the name of your Son. Amen. Sometimes, uh, I suppose after a sermon like that, we might finish off with a, a, a song, I suppose encouraging us to go out and play our part um, in God's mission to us. But what I wanted to do today was instead finish with a song that focuses on Christ to remind us why uh, we're called to go out and share the good news. Because we do have a saviour. Uh, because we do have uh, a saviour who died for us, who gave his life for us. And we come and focus on him now. There is our Redeemer, Jesus, God's own Son. <clears throat> Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you all this day and forevermore. Amen.